Hey folks, welcome to this very special episode of the Brief Encounter podcast with me, Johnny Boyle. On this episode, I interview my very good friend, Cullen McAnumra. Uh, Cullen was a founding member of The Frames as well as Keela. And in, the, in recent years, um, he's had a very successful career in his own right, uh, releasing three solo albums, um, The Hair's Corner, and now the weather and the river holds its breath the most recent record um, on this episode uh, we talk about Cullum's family background and his introduction to the violin and music lessons we talk about the busking scene back in the 90s and how vibrant the music scene was back then um, we talk about the formation of the frames and um, the deciding factors for Cullum to pursue, pursue his own solo career uh, we reminisce on some tour stories, particularly uh, our time touring with uh, Bob Dylan around Australia and uh, New Zealand in 2007. And um, it's just a really nice chat um, because I suppose I got to find out a lot of things I didn't know about Cullum. And, um, and he's been a very good friend for a long time and a very unique uh, musician. If you get a chance to listen to his solo records, um, they're very special. Um, and we talk a little bit about those as well so hope you enjoyed this episode and I just want to thank Cullum for taking the time to talk to me and I want to send a special shout out to Duncan Maitland who's been mastering all these podcasts so I'm staring at my ri- window here on a very dull rainy day in Ireland so I hope everybody's staying safe out there and I hope gigs will come back soon, please soon, we need to play ok folks, mind yourself take care and stay safe, bye <laughs> So yeah, it's funny actually, I just had a look on your site and I was kind of reading through some stuff and as much as we know each other a long time, there's lots of stuff I don't know about you. Mm. So I was going to ask, well first I was going to ask you, how's your COVID experience been the last few months in terms of creativity or... Yeah, I mean, it's been funny. Uh, it's been quiet. I live out in the countryside with my family on the side of a hill in Wexford. So to be honest, it hasn't been that big of a an issue. Um I work from home, I've got a studio at home, so uh, I've kind of been just working away through it, and so it hasn't been a huge, you know, um, thing. I mean, obviously the kids are <laughs> have been at home for the past uh, six months, um, and you know, it's it's it's, but you know, I've totally it's been a it's been months of uh, having a sense of gratitude about you know. The fact that we made the choices that we made at a particular time and moved out of the city and you know have some room around us and you know so uh yeah gratitude has been my sense yeah i'd, I'd be similar in terms of very grateful for being able to reflect a little bit and take a step back from the madness of my life just you know spinning so many plates so it, it, you know it's definitely a great time to kind of clean out the cupboard but i think for people in, in dublin who are so used to being able to go here and go there and go into town and I I, I, I was in town um, like during lockdown I had to go in and just pick something up and so I went in one day and it was it was funny because I was able to just pull my car up on the on the <laughs> on the curb like on Wicklow Street and just leave it there there's no one you know but uh, but the only person I bumped into was Richard Boyd Barrett <laughs> in Fallon and Byrne wow. <laughs> and we had a bit of a chat you know um, but even going in there of late. It's kind of like every day is like a Sunday around midday. It's it's, mm. it's there's very little going on. Yeah, I mean, I I went up. I got one of those um, you know letter special dispensations to go up and do the late late show with uh, with Glenn, and um, there was like wasn't a single car on the road. It was like dystopian, you know. And yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what I did uh, an illustration is that I uh, I completely spaced off at the turn because I had no kind of traffic to kind of keep me in and um, so I kind of daydreamed my way to Tala I had to turn around <laughs> and go back to Donnybrook so yeah yeah I, mental it's funny I was walking over one of the flyovers today uh, with Dave from Picture House and I mean it, it, it's great to see you know, there's lots of traffic on the M50 but there was days when I was walking where you actually wouldn't see a car on yeah. the M50 you know 
know, it's definite. It was like, you know, Omega Man or I know, <laughs> you know, the last I know. man on earth. Yeah, yeah. Very weird. I kind of figured that obviously living in a rural area would be different to living in an urban area, you know. And it was very weird being. I'm very grateful here as well because I live near the Dublin mountains so yeah, I could exactly. walk up to the Hellfire right. Club or Massey's Woods or, yeah. and get out in the fresh air and actually what was great was living in this community here was the amount of people out walking and probably lots of people who've been putting it off for a long time but I, I do have concerns about the winter kind of creeping in and people not being able to get out or you know yeah and also I mean you know the, the, the we're kind of on the knife edge so that as the cases are going up exponentially we're also just gone back to school and we're opening the pubs so I mean it's yeah. kind of like a, I don't know you know uh, political imperatives uh, versus kind of health and safety concerns are, are it's just a really interesting and worrying kind of point to be at and then heading into flu season and knowing that your health service is completely underfunded and <laughs> you know yeah, so like yeah. I think I think it's um you, you do get the kind of worrying kind of thing from now and again that, that you know they, they are making it up as they go along and they're winging it you know and, yeah. and that kind of sense of I think the political side of it as well is that they're the, they're kind of like a there's a fragility about the government that you know that there is a sense that you know the, the tail being able to wag the dog do you know as regards be that the kind of the different lobbies you know yeah I, I really empathise with people you know outside of the cities because if you're a farmer and you live in a, a very kind of a, a quiet area where there, there might be a local pub that they go yeah, down totally, to, you, know, yeah. you know those very yeah. quiet rural pubs where you might see six people on, on a daily basis and these people are very isolated and very lonely and it is their only point of contact with other people mm. so I do I do really really empathise with those kind of people and I'm hoping they can kind of have that connection during the winter or just having somewhere to go you know um, I mean we've you know, I've had people in the house and stuff like that and uh, but now it's gone back to you know my daughter's 18 next month she can't have an 18th birthday party yeah. I mean, and to be honest with you there's bigger issues than that oh yeah you know? no but I mean th those things are kind of uh, profound as well and you know you're only 18 months and you know there is a kind of case of um, it is tough on the, our younger people as well you know that kind of um, you know uh, like we live um, you know as I was saying out in the sticks so the like the internet is kind of key and trying to balance the kind of you know being online with your kids you're letting them be online and knowing that you know that is his kind of lifeline to communicating with his friends and you know um so yeah i suppose it's it, you know may you live in interesting times isn't that the saying well that's, <laughs> well, that's it well that's it well i mean i'm just i suppose i'm hoping in terms of gigging and some sense of normality that you know cause i remember when it started a lot of people were like oh well i'll be back gigging by by may june yeah. and i was thinking yeah. i don't know about that you know yeah um, and I think I think a lot of people, you know, vaccine or no vaccine, I think it's kind of a lot of people are going to be phobic of, you know, crowds and, you know, um, as as a was a David O'Doherty was posting something today about, you know, going back into the, oh, I can't remember what it was, um, you know, I can't wait to get back into the 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 the. the the tide of droplets at a gig. <laughs> we are wading through the tide of droplets at a gig. Can't wait for that again, you know. Yeah. So it is, you know. I think it is gonna. It is an interesting. I mean, from from a from a another point of view, it's really. I mean, I'm intrigued by the idea of it. It's so kind of like a bespoke kind of antidote to all of the um, um, excesses of you know burning the planet down which you've been doing for you know 50 odd years um so it poses some i think really interesting uh, potential and opportunities you know environmentally and uh just uh, mental health wise and you know just getting i think it's uh, the, the opportunity for people to kind of have a sense of kind of silence for the first time in their lives yeah you know to hear a bird song and to kind of become conscious of just for the for the you know for the rat race to stop momentarily has been very profound for people. Well, a part of it is: does the human race do we deserve this to a degree? There's a certain element of deserving, you know, and, and a wake up call to the kind of greed and capitalism, mm. and that, as you say, the poison that we're putting in the air and in mm. the oceans, um, and as you say, the bird song and seeing no cars and the air 
just mm. feeling better in your yeah. lungs. Yeah. Um, but of course, mankind is just going to go back to doing the same thing we did. Well, that's the that's the worry, you know. And and maybe kind of it's a case of you know people people only change when they have to change. I mean, that's kind of the the it's kind of an imperial <laughs> empirical law. Um, and I think I think this will possibly go on as long as until we've properly learnt our lesson, hopefully, and can start to do things differently. But I mean, it is kind of you, you know it will be interesting to see the the vaccine kind of end of things and how long that's going to go on, and then how I mean it is kind of completely science fiction becoming science fact as regards yeah. you know pandemic and and um, and then the potential for you know. How expensive is a vaccine going to be? And, you know, whether you're going to have a two tier kind of or multi tiered kind of availability of vaccine and are there going to be places where you're going to, what's going to be the unclean zone? And, you know, there's all these kind of yeah. um, frightening and, uh, you know, exciting <laughs> possibilities. And the conspiracy theory is saying, you know, you're getting microchipped while they're doing that. See, oh, yeah, kind of yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Well, look, fingers crossed. Um, so I, I was going to ask you just in terms of, um, I generally kind of start chronologically with people and kind of where the journey began. And I know that, you know, your your father is from Connemara and very much deep rooted in Irish culture and history. And uh, is your mom, your mom was a classic, well, classical musician? And Yeah, my mom, well, I suppose my mom comes from a, like a big family. My dad, my mom comes from a family of 11. My dad comes from a family of 10. Both of them are from Connacht. So my mom's from Leitrim. My dad's from Connemara. Um, my mum probably was raised in a kind of a more kind of um, just classical music lessons. Everybody played an instrument, um, sort of household. It was something that they did. She went to boarding school in Sligo, so there would have been like piano lessons and violin lessons. And um, my dad is from kind of a like um, um, his he is my dad's people. It's an interesting story as regards and um, they like a couple of five or six generations of my dad's family worked as the kind of custodians or like um, they'd bring the gentry out on the local river. The house was on a river and um, the you know, gentry would come and then they'd bring in, bring them salmon, trout fishing and um, sure. The, and, um, but um, the, the fella who owned us, owned the estate while my dad was alive was a guy called Bruce Ismay. And um, he was a guy who actually dressed up as a woman to get off the Titanic. And wow. he spent his last years living in the big house uh, in Kostla, uh living very, you know, um, so that was, so it's, uh, it really, so it's kind of, um, and then there's stories of like the likes of, um, you know, Charles Stuart Parnell and all that sort of thing, kind of people being out, you know, in a boat, fishing at different points. Um, but I mean, my dad, uh, uh, amazing stories about like he'd be doing his homework by candlelight in the house and li the, literally the river went underneath the house and sometimes it went through to when there were a couple of times through his lifetime where it uh, it uh, flooded. So the river was literally going in and out through the front and back door. Um, but he had the story of uh, doing his homework by candlelight and my granddad going out with his lantern, with a bucket and his rod, and go down underneath the house, and then come back with um, lehan. I think they're uh, trout, yes, yeah, so mm. sea trout, mm. and putting the pan on the fire and putting the, the you know the trout. But that's kind of that's what's his. And then he would have gone. He would have left there about in his. Um, he got a like I think the first couple of kids they got scholarships and kind of managed to went to boarding school, secondary school in Galway, and then went on to Dublin. So yeah, and then my mum's. Um, she would have, her dad was a, a doctor so he was um you know basically <laughs> if there's a child delivered between you know 30 or 40 years still during gigs i remember over the years people would come up to me and i'd do gigs oh my your, your grandfather delivered me kind of thing and um and he was actually an interesting story as well he was um in the ira in during the 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 1919, 1920. I think he joined the IRA in Galway as a medical student, and then um, when he was in Rat Mines uh, lodging, he was. Um, recently, I was working on a, a commission about Bloody Sunday, you know, 1920 in Croke Park, where the British Army came in and shot 14 people, just basically fired indiscriminately on the crowd. Um, 
but he was on duty with the IRA that morning um, where the the IRA kind of um, assassinated all of the Secret Service people that the, the British Army had um, in Dublin and uh, so he was on, on, on one of those operations so as a medical student med- medical orderly in case any one of their lads got shot and it was the one day that I remember that he actually spoke about you know and he had a ticket for the game and didn't go and um, that uh, so was it, so yeah so then when you get kind of the opportunity then to to write music about it it was kind of like a hair raising I'm sure <laughs> kind of thing I'm sure it was I'm sure it was yeah so interesting interesting um, and of course then you know two two big families from from Connacht you know basically the the, the, the like probably 70 percent emigration you know so yeah. like there's of no a very few of that immediate family in in leitrim they all they all left leitrim you know so there'd be so everywhere the, there was a running joke for years with the frames that anywhere we would play in the world um there would be a cousin that would show up or you know a relation <laughs> for the guest list you know and, and it got to such a point where i remember we were uh, in uh, seoul in korea and um, we're doing a sound check, and uh, I think it was Mike was Mike Fry was tour managing us at the time, and he comes out. Um, anybody for the guest list? Anybody? Um, Column? Anybody? And he said, no, literally, uh, I have nobody for the guest list tonight. And literally, comic timing at that moment says, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Corum, uh, here's a note for you. And it was my um, my father's first cousin was a Columban priest in Seoul, Johnny Vicky, uh, Johnny Vitti. And, he, and I completely forgot that he was in Seoul. And sure enough, he left a message and wondering if he could get tickets. <laughs> so there we were in Korea. Oh, it's hilarious. That's amazing. That's um, Was your mum from Connemara? My mum's from Leitrim, yeah. Oh, she's from Leitrim, so, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Your dad was from Connemara. Yeah, yeah. And did they marry before they moved to Dublin? Or? Yeah, they met in Dublin. And actually, my mum come from, uh, came like, was Irish-speaking as well, as it happened, from Leitrim. I mean, that my grandfather, I suppose it was all part of the time, the, the you know, the cultural renaissance um, of, you know, Conor na Gaelga, the Gaelic League, it's GAA, and the the kind of that was all part of the kind of part and parcel of the the national movement the movement for independence you know okay okay so yeah so she spoke irish and then when they met um they would have made a conscious decision to raise their kids you know through irish in in dublin i mean my dad was teaching as a, a, in a primary school in in monkstown it's going mm-hmm. and so we went to that and then we went down to clush own then you know right and um what was your was it your mother who taught you violin and piano? No, she was. She would like. A, a, we we went to kind of. Uh, I actually learned to went to lessons in New Park. You know where where Mark Erie was talking about. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. About it. So I, yeah, there's a kind of a. I think it's it's pretty more advanced now. The the music school. It's kind of the past couple of years. It's and um, but that that was I suppose the the origins of that. Um, uh, yeah, which. And it was within walking distance, so it's handy. Okay, because I know I think Binzer's son, original, okay. original Frames drummer Binzer, his son Jake. Okay, was kind of, and I remember him telling me something about when you actually go to the secondary school, or the, uh, they teach you an instrument, so you get a free le- uh, as part of free lesson, which I think is brilliant. excellent. Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. I, I still think in primary schools and secondary schools, like music is still taught. It's it's very rigid. Yeah, and, and I think also, also it's the whole idea of like um, it's a privileged kind of thing. Do you know, as you know, I, I think it's I'm kind of more and more you know through the through the COVID thing, you know, and with the absence of you know there being any sport to to report about, it was amazing to hear kind of more news about culture, about arts, you know, the arts in general. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but the arts shouldn't be a kind of like an add-on kind of it's it's almost kind of treated like this kind of frivolous sort of indulgence you know notions are as opposed to being kind of like a meaningful um uh you know activity that can actually you know improve your mental well-being it can actually you know be such a thing that kind of gives you uh, self-esteem do you know what I mean all yeah. these things I mean there's a few projects I remember hearing about where um, there's some schools there's an amazing woman called Joanna Crooks who um, 
uh, started this project and I think it's taken off in different schools now where every child in the school got a violin yeah. and you know and, and it was in a kind of a maybe a less well off area but that they noticed that all of the the grades across the board a lot of the like delinquent behaviour fell grades went up the whole morale of the school just changed and it's just that whole idea of even giving a child an instrument that they can that's theirs you know and there's something kind of um i kind of relate to it as well from being a kid and that kind of idea of you know this thing in the case and it's all wrapped up and it's kind of you know yeah upholstery and it's kind of it's your thing and it's kind of um it's great for kids it's kind of similar to having a pet that you have yeah. a responsibility about feeding the child Nurture, feed, feed, yeah feed it and if, if you don't feed it that it, you know and that sense of thing that was really kind of um uh kind of confidence building you know yeah for, for kids you know well i've both, both my daughters at the piano one on grade six one on grade two and it's it's you know for a little while they, they wanted to stop doing it when they went into secondary school they were all in secondary school big school and um i'm so delighted they kept it up because my grandmother was a violinist and a piano oh, wow. player and would would every weekend go out on tour around ireland playing Kayleys. Mm. and that was like her pocket money you know and, and at the time she was living in uh, holt lighthouse so it's funny wow. when you mention about you know catching the trout and like you know that my father would say they'd be out the back with waves crashing in trying to get radio luxembourg <laughs> with a coat hanger you know? <laughs> you know but as a result then my dad played piano and he played guitar yeah, and, yeah. but when i went for piano lessons as a kid just the piano teachers were not nice at ah, all yeah. it was very yeah. regimental yeah. and they were just it was the classic whack across the knuckles totally and, and yeah. that just kills any mm -hmm. any joy that you might try to get out yeah. of it you know um, was your practice routine was a very regimented it, well, I mean my practice routine would have, like if I had my way it would be like playing squares outside you know with kicking a football up and down the road with my friends that, yeah. that's my, that would be my <laughs> ideal um, my mother fair play to her was you know would you know insist on us practicing and make sure that we practiced a bit anyway as much as she could um, it's, re it's really interesting where you know the through having kids <clears throat> subsequently myself I have a 17 year old and a 15 year old and um, just uh, so much about parenting is kind of watching your own life but uh, from a different camera angle you yeah. know what I mean reliving it and uh, but it's really interesting just watching the kind of dynamics of like uh, teenagers uh, and just how the you know that it, it stops being kind of being able to direct direct them it becomes more a kind of case of trying to you know set up a space for them to walk into do you know what i mean yeah. and and uh, and i think at that age it becomes far more about you know what their peer group is up to and i think from from my point i was fortunate in the time at school that uh i mean the school band we had was what became keela you know so yeah. um we had kind of so music was something that was recreational that was as well kind of on a very practical level uh, uh, was a way of kind of skipping classes because you if you had to practice for a slogan or one of these kind of feshes or whatever and um, so it was a really kind of handy way of being able to duck out and have a cigarette out the back of the school and yeah. play a few tunes yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the school were very uh, encouraging of you know all the arts and um, so that was it was great but and then that subsequently then that kind of spilled over onto um Grafton Street. Yeah. Just to get some pocket money on the on the weekend. Um so myself and Owen Dylan initially we started busking. Probably inspired and thinking back to Liam and Fiechen had started the the Benzini, Benzini Brothers. Benzini Brothers, yeah. And I think that would have been probably nineteen eighty four I think possibly and around 1985 but maybe the same year or the year afterwards myself and himself kind of like I remember literally the first day we were going in and just walking up the street and down the street and just frightened to death you know and then finally settling on a place and kind of you know playing a couple of tunes and, and then of course the more you do something then it becomes kind of a uh, you know, it takes the fear out of it and also the idea of the like Buskin's really interesting where you kind of um you disappear when you stop and then so like the the busking thing is real kind of crossroads for me as regards um also moving in from the the suburb you know and kind of getting to the city center and and grafton street in a way was kind of like a 
a gateway where you'd meet everybody who just arrived into the city that day, all the international musicians, do you know what I mean? They'd all kind of congregate and they'd pass through. So you'd, a long la- line of kind of, you know, there's, I remember just off the top of my head, there was an, uh, an Israeli uh, a musician called Yossi, and there was a, an amazing hammer dulcimer player called Phil, and then there was, you know, oh, any number of people that we would have kind of just been a part of the. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like a motley troupe, you know. We'd yeah. we'd um, we'd start off early in the day, maybe in pairs, and kind of make a bit of money that way. And then in later in the afternoon, a lot of these kind of gathered into one kind of um, larger group, and that was kind of the likes of you know Glenn, Glenn Hansard, and and. Mark Dignam and Mick Christopher yeah. and the lads from the Pale as well, and so that was yeah, it was great. It was a great scene, but that was yeah. Was the Dice Man still? He still was yeah, Tom McGinty point. yeah, oh, he's yeah. amazing. And yeah, that uh, then there was another amazing character, um, guy called Colonel Mustard. Right. He used to wear like a like a he was a real vaudeville kind of um, had a sort of suitcase. <clears throat> there was some sort of puppets involved in it, but he was dressed in this one a onesie essentially, with kind of like the kind of uh, Piero clown sort of frills and yeah. uh, an English gentleman. But uh, God, it's just like just real um, characters, you know, and uh, and also be it was real education as regards kind of like meeting. Um, meeting people from all sorts of backgrounds, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and you know, getting to know the the pickpockets and the shoplifters and the all of the different, you know, fish yeah. in the <laughs> in the sea. Um, so, yeah, fantastic times, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot easier to do it then. I think Tom McGinty, the, known as the Dice Man, he had to, because he used to stand still, but then he had to change his act where he had to start, he'd move at a snail's pace because they told him he couldn't loiter in one spot. Okay, that was okay. So that's Brilliant. why Genius. you'd see yeah. him walking up, yeah. you know, really slowly up Grafton Street. Yeah. Um, amazing times back then. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's still very vibrant. I don't know if you have to get a license now. but I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of sceptical about the amplification thing, personally. I think that's a real, you know, I, I, can, I can, you know, I can understand why, but I mean, I would question, I just think it's kind of, you know, I think you're stealing, you know, you're stealing every other musician's airspace yeah. and then it becomes kind of exponential kind of noise as opposed to having to learn how to, you know, it's like fly fishing, do you know what I mean? Cast your line and then people draw in to, to, to listen what's going on. And, and then, you know, I mean, so, uh, so at different times you'd have massive crowds around us you know and, and and then of course once you've got a crowd then the the cops would hate that because you know you'd you'd be uh the the, the pickpockets would love a crowd to be able to operate in you know so there's all this kind of like pull and thrust and and um you know you know you have to move now that's oh yeah we'll just feel just finishing up and then you know the second warning the third warning but um, I only got arrested once. But uh, that was <laughs> <laughs> that's good because I, I remember going to Canada when I was nineteen for a summer uh, painting houses. Um, a funny enough, when you think of the movie The Irishman, do you, I hear you're the guy that paints houses. Oh yeah, that, that's yeah, the yeah line. exactly. Um, but I, I went painting houses. But I I remember being on the streets and seeing these these guys busk- playing plastic buckets. Oh yeah, yeah. Street. I remember coming home thinking I'll, I'll have a go with that in Grafton Street, and I had a couple of buckets that had different tones. And same thing, massive crowd. I didn't actually expect to get the yeah, reaction right. I'd got because I'd never seen anything like that yeah. in Dublin. But again, I I did it a f- for a few days, but I was getting so much hassle from the guards. I kind of yeah. gave up eventually because yeah. I knew once I started, I had five minutes and they'd move me on. And, yeah, you know. And also, I think for like politically, I think it kind of definitely influenced me as regards you know, um, you know, here is the city of Dublin and who owns the streets, you know, as regards, you know, being able to, the, 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 the guards were there to, uh, to move the citizens on. I mean, uh, since, and as I get older, of course, I appreciate that <laughs> businesses have to pay rates and all of this kind of things, but still, I think it would have definitely kind of opened my eyes as regards to, you know, 
we talk about our cities and well how much of it is ours and you know how much freedom do we actually have or so it's, you know it's, it's definitely kind of instructive when you're you know in a put into the back of a a, a cop car and, the, and when you're like 15 or whatever and brought down for a couple of hours to cool your heels yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> while they rang our parents and, uh, my, my, my dad used to busk in the London underground when, in his 50s and I was thinking to him, why, why, why are you busking at your age what do you need that for and he goes the reason I'm doing it is because I get a free pass and free travel all over London because you've access to the underground so you could go down and once you had your card you oh, never yeah, had to pay to get a train yeah, so yeah. he was getting free travel and making a few quid at the brilliant. same time which was and great great acoustics as well brilliant yeah, acoustics yeah. so he didn't have to again yeah. mic anything yeah. up or just you know never rains <laughs> <laughs> never rains yeah, that's perfect <laughs> perfect <laughs> no. so uh, Initially, I suppose, so meeting Glenn and Mark and the guys in the pale. And so, we like when the frames kind of started, what, what did Glenn initiate the relationship with you, or was it just did it happen organically? Or, yeah, well, I think it was like uh, so, like, I was definitely a member of Keela, so Keela were kind of like the the extended, so it was the the Snuddy brothers, Ronan and Russa and Colm. And then Owen Dylan and myself, and then the two Odlum brothers, so Carl and Dave. So we all were in, in you know, a year or two within each other in the two classes in school. And um, so then uh, Glenn was putting a band together. It's 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 funny, you know, just to trace the course because when I met Glenn, I suppose <coughs> um, Glenn and Mick were sharing a flat in town in in Harcourt Street, and. So they were kind of like we were still, you know, living at home. Um, I don't know if it was a doing the intercert or whatever. And there were two lads, you know, teenagers themselves. Maybe yeah. two. Maybe Mick was three years, I think, ahead of me, and Glenn was just a year. So they were like independent. So that so that kind of, if you remember back to that time as well, when you're a teenager, there's a huge difference between fifteen and sixteen, or fifteen yeah. and seventeen. Yeah. You know, there's a whole kind of like it's it's nearly your decades apart in in many ways. Um, so they seem to be kind of way more kind of advanced or you know sorted, and um, and then Glenn, I think he'd been um, playing with like gigs with um, Hank Halfhead right. and stuff, and then he made a demo with the lads um, from the Blue Angels, and ended up being out with Marina in in her house and. Um, Denny was there, I think Denny Cordell and um, what's his name from the police, the drummer. Uh, oh, Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland. Um, so Stuart and Denny were there and they decided to that Chris should hear this, Chris Blackwell, um, oh, they sent, the, sent the demo to, and Marianne Faithful was there as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So wow. it's like an all star cast. Wow. And as I recall, and so they ended up. Uh, sending this to Chris Blackwell and then Glenn signed a deal and then wanted to put a band together from his extended musical family I suppose and I think I ended up kind of being in the band by accident really because I think Dave had joined Dave Odlum um, and John Carney who I didn't know at all was playing bass and Binzer was uh, Dave's brother Carl's friend from rock school? So, right. so, so uh, I was recording downstairs in Sun in Crow Street and um, with Colmus Nuddy, he was making a, a solo record of his songs. Um, and I remember bumping into Glenn in the reception in Sun and he was going, Oh, we're, we're rehearsing upstairs, sure, um, drop up later if you want and um, bring your fiddle with you and it's a case of like uh, I went upstairs in one band and came down in another band so I ended up ever playing along and you know nobody told me to leave <laughs> Well, at this point, Glenn had done the commitments, hadn't he? No, no. Oh, this is before, done? yeah. Okay, yeah. so was so he this is, oh, Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so the whole thing was happening well advanced before the commitments. Okay. So that happened in 1990. Um, I suppose the film... 
I, my memory of it is that we played like one of our first gigs the first official gig frames gig was in 1990 in the Clifton Blues Festival and that was probably August okay. August or early September and I think we got together maybe earlier that year maybe in the spring or before the summer anyway because I remember actually our first gig was opening up for a band called Lord John White in the Bagus. It became Sack. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jungle Burger was one of their <laughs> tunes, I remember. Great tune. Yeah. yeah. And so they, 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 that was our first gig in the Bagus. And um, so, yeah, and, and then, um, yeah, the commitments then happened. And that was kind of like a mixed 